Well, this morning I want to continue on our series, The Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to be jumping into uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 24. Now I'm going to talk about stewardship this morning and finance. Now I'm going to just tell you up front, you're probably already thinking, oh great, a sermon where the pastor asks for money. We're going to talk about it, but I want you to understand it's not about asking for money. It's about us being obedient to God's call upon our life when it comes to stewardship. It's about obedience, not about the money. God doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your money. But if you're going to be obedient, it's about you being obedient to his call. And you're going to hear that in today's scripture. So I'm just going to be up front. I, I was trying to think how to cleverly introduce the subject I'm not that pastor that's so slick that he gets you to give like gobs and gobs of money I'm not that guy and I'm like well how do I do it I'm just going to be honest with you it's about obedience this morning I just want to make sure you're understanding that up front so that we're clear but you'll understand it as we walk through the scripture this morning from Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 to 24 Jesus begins with these words. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. In other words, your, your eyes, if they're able to see and allow the light in, it will be able to come in and permeate the entire body. But if your eyes are not good or your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Either they're open or they're closed. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? In other words, you're missing out on what God has for you. And Jesus goes on to say, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And he goes on to say this, you cannot serve both God and money. Okay. Again, Jesus is talking to us about this idea of obedience. But he's also dealing with it in the context of stewardship. So let's kind of walk through some of these scriptures this morning. Jesus has some questions for us. There's some questions. He doesn't ask them as directly as maybe he has, you've heard it said, kind of statements in earlier sections, trying to get us to understand what's at stake here. But he wants us to understand that you cannot serve two masters. You can only serve one. And he's trusting that we will choose God as our master, not something else. Again, that goes back to the whole idea of thou shalt have no other gods before me. We're going back to the Ten Commandments. There is only one God, and you can only serve one. So he goes into dealing with this. So Jesus has some questions for us. So, so some Jesus questions this morning. You ready for them? The first one he wants to talk to us about is durability. Durability. Will your treasure last? Anyone ever had a battery that didn't last as long as you wanted it to? You're laughing because you know exactly what I'm talking about. You think that, you know, that six-year battery, that seven-year battery, that's what it says. It's guaranteed 60, 60 months. 23 months later, when you go out to turn your car on and it doesn't turn over, you're thinking to yourself, that did not last. Especially when they put the label like Dura Last, right? <laughs> or my favorite Sears brand, Die Hard. What's that mean? <laughs> if you're dead, you're dead. But durability, he's asking us that durability question will it last? Part of the issue that we have to deal with is this idea of treasure. Let me just deal with that for a moment. Treasure. What is your treasure? And it may not be money. For some of people, 
it, it may not really be the money issue, okay? Because Jesus is dealing with money, but he's also dealing with treasure. So he's dealing with the broader idea of what do you value? What do you put your value on? What is your treasure? For some people, it is their castle, their house. For some people, it's the kind of car I drive. That's right, baby. Cadillac Escalade. Don't worry, I don't drive it. Sometimes our car is a, is, a, is a status for us, a symbol of status. Sometimes it's a person. Oh, you just hold that person in high esteem. Your spouse. Oh. That's for another day, maybe, for us to talk about. Maybe it's a position. Sometimes we, we define ourselves by what we do. And because of our position or, or the way that we, in which we are perceived, that is a treasure to us. My, what kind of reputation am I building? What kind of persona am I, am, I being, am I driving into the community? The thing is, are the things that we're spending the most amount of time and our resources, is it truly worth it? Is it truly worth it? Because there are things that are worth it. The question becomes, is it worth it in terms of kingdom perspective? What does God want us to do with our things and our, our treasures? How are we dealing with it? He deals with it from the position of rot, where moth and rust destroy, right? Well, back in, in the day in which Jesus was living, uh, it was very common for moths to get into the clothing. Um, now we have moth balls to deal with some of those issues. But back in the day, wool clothing had a, a good opportunity for the moth to come in. Well, if you've ever seen moth, moths get into wool clothing. It's ugly. They don't just take like big sections. They just nibble at it and make these little tiny holes all over the place. It's flat out annoying is what it is. And so Jesus said, you know, we're, we're moth, we're rot. Things are going to break down over time. Decay. We all have things that rot and decay. Here up in the, in the, if you live in Florida, it's not such a big deal in terms of that rust issue with your vehicle. Because unless you're living on the beach or close to the beach, you're not dealing with the salt that's causing the rust. I was talking to some of my friends the last couple days, and we've been talking about the rust on our vehicles that's kind of shown up over time. And it picks certain places to decide to rust rather than just all over. It's a spot here or a spot there. Will it last? So we have this temporal kind of scenario versus eternal. What are you investing? Is it going to last? Will your treasure last? If you're, what are you investing in? Will it last? The reality is this. Our stuff, our treasure, can be stolen. I want everyone to just take a moment and turn around and look at the back wall. Just turn around. Look at the back wall. Everyone see the 70-inch TV on the back wall? Okay, because I'm going to give you a perspective here. We were building this building. Mr. Arvin Carpenter, Mr. Iris Schaefer, they placed a TV just like that up on the wall. On the wall, people! It got stolen. I knew I should have told the, the electricians to take that ladder. No, I didn't. I, they actually asked me the day before. They said, should we take this ladder? No, it's good. It was the ladder of opportunity is what it was. <laughs> but stuff can be stolen. I got to tell you, when, when stuff gets stolen, it's a real pain. Especially when you're dealing with an insurance company. And, and in this case, we, it was broken. So not only did they get a, a TV, they got a broken TV. Whoever they tried to sell it to probably did not like it too well. But our stuff can be stolen. Our stuff can be seized by the government. I have a person right now that they've got a lien by the IRS against their, and frozen all their accounts. 
Stuff can be seized by the government. Destroyed by natural disaster. You never know what's going to happen. This week, just this week, we've had churches that have caught on fire. This week, we had 34 of our churches in Bangladesh that were covered over by, by a tsunami. I mean, you don't know if, you're gonna, if it's going to last in this world. You do the best you can, but it, it, are you building it to last? We have no guarantees in this world. There are no guarantees that everything's going to last. The question is, are you placing your emphasis on that which is eternal or that which is temporal? Not saying that you don't have some things that are temporal, but some of those temporal things do have eternal, eternal rewards and an eternal ramifications. So don't think that I'm not saying don't have stuff. Don't invest in people. I'm not saying that. I'm saying make sure you're investing with the right motive. Will it last? Will it last? The second question Jesus asks is a heart question. Does your heart reflect your treasure? He says where your treasure is there, your heart will be as well. So a lot of times we can look at our heart, and it's pretty easy to start to say, where do we spend our time and money? It's pretty easy to find out where our treasure is. And maybe it's, it has a lot to do with our time. What are we investing in? Who are we investing in? Are we investing in the things of God or are we investing in the things for myself? For some of us, it's, it's saying, sometimes it's those things we want, the want list. How many of us have a want list? Don't worry, a lot of you are getting ready to get your want list out because Christmas is just around the corner. But we do. We sometimes have that want list, and sometimes it, it drives us to think about the wants. I want this. I want that. I want to do this. I want to do that. We've got the bucket list of things to do, the bucket list of stuff. Right? So does your heart reflect your treasure? <coughs> Some of the questions we have to ask ourselves. And Jesus is asking us that. Does our heart reflect our treasure? And then the third thing he deals with is the mind. What really catches your focus or your attention? What catches your mind or attention? The reality is that we cannot be focused on more than one thing at one time. Ladies, I know that you can multitask better than guys. We get that. Guys, we're willing to concede, right? Women are better multitaskers than we are, typically. I know a few guys that are really good at multitasking, but as, as a general rule of thumb. But what catches, what catches our attention or catches our focus, that's we, we can only focus on one thing at a time. Either we'll be focused on that which is godly or that which keeps us from the godly. Sometimes we're doing good things, but even good things can keep us from the godly. One of my, one of my friends, um, his name was Bill, and Bill, Bill uh, became a Christian later in life. Uh, his kids uh, um, went to a vacation Bible school because they got invited by their neighbors. And, and Bill had lived a kind of unique life. He had been a manager of an adult bookstore. It sold sports uh, memorabilia. Uh, they'd done a lot of different things. Uh, I think they even, even owned a bar at one point, or at least managed a bar. So that was kind of his background. And it came to Christ and, and uh, left all that behind him. Uh, radical change, just uh, doing a lot of different things. And, and he started to sense that God was, might be calling him into ministry, but uh, kind of working through that. What does God want for me? What is God asking of me? But he loved to bowl. Now, bowling in and of itself is not a bad thing, right? Except that he was bowling about three, night, three to four nights a week. Just taking away from other things. And, and God kindly went to Bill and said, Bill, if you're going to serve me, you have to give up bowling. 
because you can't serve me and bowling. Bowling in and of itself is not bad, but it was taking away from that which was not godly. And so because he wanted to be obedient, he said no to bowling. Even though he hadn't bowled for a long time, we went out one night. He, would, he had shared the story. and I, I think it had been probably five, six years since he had bowled. He hadn't picked up the ball for a long time. He still scored a 240. I thought to myself, I'm good to get over 100. But what catches your focus and your attention? You can only serve one. <coughs> only one thing can get your whole attention at a time. Now, we can have like mixed, mixed bag, lots of different things, but in terms of real attention, real focus, only one thing at a time. And, and he goes on to say this. You can only serve, you can't serve God and serve money at the same time. One has to be your master. And who do you choose or which do you choose? Jesus asks that of us. Who's your master? Is it the treasure, the money, or is it God? See, God's not opposed to people having money. It's just how we utilize those funds, how we use those resources. Some of the richest people I've known in my lifetime, I didn't know that they were as rich as they were. But they were all about kingdom business. And they gave heavily and secretly, in a lot of ways, to that cause. But we have to choose. Do you choose God or do you choose money? But, but I can tell you this. Choosing to serve God and not money does not come by accident. It is intentional. You can't say, oh, I'm going to choose God today. And just by accident, you serve him. No, it's by choice. It's by deliberate action and intentionality. See, Jesus is dealing with this idea of treasure and everything because he's talking about obedience. Obedience. Who will you serve and what will you be driven to serve? Who will you serve and where will you, who will you be driven to serve? You've heard the old saying, put your money where your mouth is. For us and the church, if we're truly going to be about kingdom business, we have to be about kingdom stewardship. And we have to ask the question of ourselves, what do I love? And who do I love? What do I love and who do I love? Because that will drive us to do things that are kingdom in nature. Our budget for this church is close to $290,000. Our annual budget, and to kind of break it down, in terms of break it down, you'll see about 40% goes to our staff, 41% to operational facilities. Um, we've been able to reduce some of our, our costs by building a new building in terms of our, uh, some of our heating and cooling costs. Those actually went down in terms of some of the old uh, numbers that we used to look at. Um, but we carry a mortgage. Um, that's about $3,300 a month for us. So building fund, that's how we, we help with some of that. So 41% going to facilities and operational. You'll see 4% it says discipleship and children's ministry. It's supposed to be discipleship and children and youth ministry. It's all anything that covers underneath the guise of Sunday school, which is adult ministries, youth ministries, children's ministries. So everything that we're doing in terms of like true ministry kinds of things, because that's pretty much where most of that happens, is only about 4%. And then we've got 10% going to denominational budget, and then another 5% to World Evangelism Fund. Just to give you a ballpark, it's, it actually breaks out slightly different than that. It's 5.5% and 9.5%. Okay? But you get the idea. 15%, 15 cents on every dollar goes out to denominational in pursuits. Now, why do I point, point this out to you? Because if we're going to get behind the, the ministry of the church and winning our community for Christ, you need to understand we're, we're trying to do it as a team. Our staff is important to the overall picture of our church. 
If you're not sure about that, go ask somebody about what they know about our church and the things they're hearing about our church. They're talking about the ministries of our church, the people of our church, and how those things are impacting our community. So staff is important for us, but it's also how we're trying to do these things. At the end of the month, we have a, a big, long week of stuff for kids. Emphasis on children during that week, the last week in October. Family worship here. I don't know anybody that's doing it. So I can't just call my buddy up and say, Bubba, how are you doing your family worship stuff? We're taking out some new, we're trying out some new stuff by trying to bridge gaps, bridge generational endeavors. It takes a staff of people to make it happen. <coughs> so if you love your church, but more importantly, do you love your God? You'll give to the endeavors of the church because you're saying, you know what, that person coming to Jesus Christ to, to see a life change from a person on the outside who doesn't have a relationship with God, to be radically changed through the salvation of Jesus, through Jesus Christ. How much is that person worth to you? It should be priceless. But it still takes dollars and cents to make that happen. So how do you do that? Well, let's, I'll break it out for you. I know it's maybe a little hard to read some of this. Let's say, for instance, you know, I, I'll, I'll just pick $15,000 here. Maybe your annual income is $15,000. It's a little more than what I made when I was in college. So you'd say, okay, $15,000 at 10%. Giving the tithe, that means a tenth. That God really, the minimum God asks is really for, but it's $1,500. You're like, wow, that's a lot of money. As a, as a poor college kid, $1,500 going out the door when you're making car payments and insurance payments, all those things, you think to yourself, that could, be, that could be really tough. But Jesus isn't about the money. He's about obedience. So he starts to say, okay, how do you do that? So, so annual giving. Pick, pick your pick. And maybe you say, you know what, I, I, I'm really... Cash strapped. I had a friend of mine, he, uh, uh, for a period of time, for about eight months, they were so ravaged by um, some disaster in their family that they, could, they couldn't give. So he had to find different ways of giving his treasure. Um, his wife got hit with cancer and, the, and, the, and some of that particular bills were not covered under the insurance. Daughter was sexually assaulted at school, required counseling and things that were not covered by their insurance. I mean, just horrific stuff. Had to go to the pastor and say, look, you know, here's where I'm at. We, we, you know, the, the, the bills are mounting up. They're saying we've got to pay these things, and they're not covered. The pastor said, you know what? Do what you can and be obedient to the call of stewardship. So he was there faithfully doing whatever he could to give back by the means that he could until he was able to get back to the place that he could give financially. So I need you to understand it's not just about the financial, but some people have higher abilities to give. Some people I know have been able to give heavily to the church out of obedience. Um, guy, I don't, there's one guy I know that I don't even know personally, and, but he was sharing with things in, in a book that he wrote. He said, you know, we started out at 10% and we just kept going up. He said, now we're giving over 50% of everything that we bring in to the, back to God's work. He's like, I don't even really know what that number is. I just know that we do it because we love Jesus out of obedience. So if you say, how does that break out? Well, monthly giving, maybe you break that to a monthly giving. So $15,000, just to use that one, uh, $125 a month. Okay. For me, just to give you an idea, $125 back in, when I was a college student, that would have been my monthly insurance, car insurance bill. It's probably way more than that today. But back in the day, that's how much I, about how much I was paying in car insurance. So what's that breakdown in terms of weekly? I don't know. It's not on there? It's on here, but... Something happened. Well, you get the idea. I don't know where it went. Maybe I accidentally clicked because, yeah, I printed it out. So, 
All right, so you get the idea. So $15,000 per week, less than $30 a week. Okay? You do the math. The point is, if you're investing in the kingdom, you will reap kingdom benefits. It's about being obedient. It's not about what you're giving. God doesn't need your money, but he wants you to be obedient with your money. So that's the big deal. It's this. We give of ourselves out of the love we have for God. We give of ourselves out of the love we have for God. Do you love him a little or do you love him a lot? Is he your treasure or is he just down the list? Does he have first place in your life or not? All of us have to answer that question. Recently, we've been a little bit behind in our giving. Numbers have been going up. We've been reaching more people. Have a great. I continue to hear positive things in our community about what we're doing in our, in our ministries. But our giving has kind of had a little bit of a lull. <coughs> I'm not here to talk to you about beat you up. I'm just here to say... Are you being obedient? Because that's what God would ask me. Are you being obedient? Are you giving of what God would want you to give? I'd love to get caught up. But that would mean about a $50,000, reach about $50,000 this month to get caught back up. I don't know if that would happen. I don't know. But I do know this. We have served a God who is all about obedience. I encourage you to, to ask yourself, am I being obedient to God? Do I love him in order to be obedient? It takes all of us. Remember the widow and the Pharisees? We talked about it a couple weeks ago. They were giving out of their, their abundance, and she gave all she had. Jesus says she's got the right idea. It's not the amount that she gave. Because it wasn't worth anything, really, in the grand scheme of things. But she was willing to give it all. <coughs> I don't know that God's asking us to give it our all, but he's at least asking us to be obedient with what he says he wants us to give back. The question is, are you being obedient? If you are, great. If you're not, we've got a God who will help you get there. I'll even, I'll even make a big, bold statement. Okay, if you start giving and God doesn't, God does, you don't start to find that God is blessing you because of your obedience, after three months, I'll go, you come talk to me and I'll go to Vicki and I'll have her write you a check. I know, Vicki, you're going to get scared about that. I know you don't like writing checks. <laughs> but if you, God doesn't bless you through the obedience that you give... You come talk to me, and we'll make sure that we cut you a check for the amount you've given. If you feel like God is not doing a work in you, because we serve a God who's all about serving.